Hi everyone. So this is an email that I get quite a lot. It says, hi Nate, our application is really slow, but our dashboards look okay. We don't really understand what's going on. Can you please help us? And the Japanese version is always like a lot longer for some reason. I don't know why. Well, usually the reason why is that there's a queue. And that queue is, for some reason, not being instrumented. So today, we're going to talk about queues. What they are, how to track them, and what to do about them. If we haven't met yet, hajime mashite. My name is Nate Berkepeck, and I'm a Ruby on Rails performance consultant. I'm also a maintainer of Puma and the author of several books on Rails performance. So I've worked on Rails applications and making them faster for about six years now. And over that time, I have seen hundreds of individual Rails applications. And at this point, actually thousands of people uh, to talk about their Rails applications at in-person workshops uh, and at conferences about why they're slow um, and what to do about it. So also two years ago, or two years ago, two months ago, um, I moved to Tokyo with my family. And I'm sorry, this talk is not in Japanese. I'm still learning more Japanese every day, but I am still a very long way away from being able to give a talk in Japanese. So maybe in uh, five years or so, I can submit a talk to Rail, uh, Kaigi on Rails again, but uh, this time in, in Japanese. So in this talk, we're going to be covering three different types of queues in a Rails application. And as Rails engineers, we're often responsible for the full stack of the app, including front end and deployment. So this talk is necessarily going to cover uh, not just Rails, but also web servers, Sidekick, and Ruby itself. Almost every Rails application I've ever seen use a, uh, uses a web server, Sidekick, and Ruby. So. I think you can see why this talk is still relevant to a uh, Rails conference. So first we're gonna talk about sidekick queues. Uh, background jobs are an important part of any application and understanding just how sidekick queues work will give us a good starting point for understanding other kinds of queues. Second, we're gonna discuss application server queues. These queues are extremely important because they serve web requests from real human beings that are waiting on that response. So if these queues get long, people notice and they start complaining. So finally, we're going to look at queuing in VM locks uh, in Ruby itself. So understanding how and why the VM, the virtual machine is locked in Ruby will allow us to make intelligent decisions about concurrency settings in Puma and Sidekick. So what's a queue? Queues hold work for servers. And in queuing theory, we usually say that the thing that's doing the work is a server. Uh, I'm going to use this word today in my talk to mean anything that can do work, not necessarily like how we think about servers normally, which is a, a physical server, a, a virtual machine, we call that a server. No, in, in queuing theory, a server is just anything that does work uh, on the queue. So in that case, in our, in, in our context, it could mean uh, a sidekick thread, a Puma thread, any of these things is, is a server. So a queue is a place where we keep work that needs to be done but we can't actually do it right now. So that is the resource which actually processes work is not currently available. So instead we make it wait in the queue. So this drawing that I've given here is actually a, a impossible state for a queuing system. Uh, I, drew, I drew the work in the queue and then the work is only on one server and there are two empty servers. So uh, in this state, uh, we would expect actually the Two, two units of work from the queue to go into the servers. Um, so I guess this is like an intermediate state, I don't know. But um, the important thing with the queue is it's not used unless all of the servers are currently unavailable. So that's, that's our first current, uh, our first critical observation. Queues are for availability. They're, they are for increasing availability. We add queues because without a queue, the work would have to be rejected because no servers are available to process the work. Uh, just imagine if, uh, for example, at the grocery store, if the checkout counter, uh, if, if, if there was some, if they're all checkout registers were already all busy, and uh, if there was no such thing as a queue, 
you would just have to leave the store. Like that's that's how queues and computers work. If there's no queue, you just have, you get rejected. So rejection is really bad. Uh, so the length of the of that queue is related to the availability of the the, the servers, the downstream that's that's taking that work off the queue. So uh, if the downstream workers are more busy, uh, then that work that queue will get longer. There will be more work in the queue. So queues in computers generally work just like queues in real life. At the grocery store, for example, there are usually multiple queues uh, with one queue for each register. However, in most queues on computers, we have multiple servers pulling from a single queue. So this is more like, for example, your local ward office or city hall. At the ward office, usually you take a number after you arrive, and that number is then placed in a virtual queue and there's usually multiple clerks, multiple desks, which can pull from this queue. There might be three or four people who are calling numbers from this queue. This is much more like how queues in computers work. So our, sick, our second critical observation about queuing systems is that they can be organized in different ways. We can arrange the same system differently with different queues in different places, like multiple queues, a queue for each register at the grocery store, and a single queue at the ward office. So later, we're going to learn about how this affects the average time spent waiting in a queue. And finally, in a queuing system, we divide the time work spends inside the system into three different numbers. We have total time, queue time, and service time. So the service time is the time actually spent doing the work. In a Rails application, this is the time between when the Rails app first reads the request off the socket and then sends it back to the client. So that service time is usually the only number that's reported on your dashboards, on Datadog, New Relic, whatever you use. Second, there's the queue time. This is just the time spent waiting for service. So that's pretty self-explanatory. You may not understand yet where things wait, in uh, like where the queuing actually occurs, but I think it should be easy to understand. Okay, queuing is just the time we spend waiting to be serviced. Queue time plus service time equals total time. So the reason why I get emails, like the one I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, is because most APM tools like New Relic, Scout, Datadog, or others tend to report only the service time by default. So at 80% or more of my clients, usually they have no queue instrumentation at all when I first arrive. And this is a critical mistake because while queue time is usually low in applications, it can become really high really quickly, particularly when the site is under a lot of load. And your customers in their web browsers, they observe the total time when they click and they wait for the response. They're not waiting for the service, actually. They're waiting for the total time. So most of us end up in a state where we have an incomplete picture of what our application is actually doing. In Sidekick, queues are pretty important, uh, uh, and they're a pretty important part of how background job processing works. So Sidekick job processing works like this. A single Sidekick process has one to n threads. And each thread can pull from one to n queues, which are just lists on a Redis database. So in Sidekick, these Sidekick processes and threads can live almost anywhere, on any server, any container or VPS, and they can still connect to the same queue. So the queue in Sidekick is actually really, really centralized. So a job's latency will look like this. Uh, the, the time spent in a queue will be the difference between the time when the job was in queued and when a Sidekick server first starts processing the job. So we can get that time in code like this. Uh, the time spent servicing the job is the difference between when we started servicing the job and when that job is completed. So I didn't write that in here, uh, but we would just like add a timestamp before and after that yield block and we could get queue latency and the latency uh, service latency we could report both of those. I re I'm reporting to New Relic here as an example um, of how that works. So there's been so many times that I've started a new job with a client, and while they have tons of instrumentation for the service times of their sidekick jobs, they might have zero 
instrumentation of their cue times. And this is a huge, huge problem because cue times and sidekick, depending on the workload, can be anywhere from zero to one minute to one hour to even one week. So, so many times I've walked into a client and I think, oh, wow. They are there thinking, wow, you know, our password reset email takes just five seconds to send. So that's great. You know, people are getting their password reset emails five seconds after they enqueue them. But then they get customer complaints and they're saying, where's my password reset email? Uh, well, it's because that, that email is spending an hour or more in a queue before it's sent. So when you look at your dashboard and it says it takes five seconds, it's kind of lying to you, uh, especially with background jobs, because background jobs usually are so fast. Uh, and queue times are comparatively are usually so much longer. So this is uh, important point number one. Uh, instrument queue time in Sidekick. I've already shown you how to create that middleware that will report this for you. It takes less than 10 lines of code. Um, your uh, APM might already have instrumentation here, but I prefer to build this myself so I understand how it works. Um, and it's just it's just so important to have instrumentation for each each queue that you have. This is a huge part of the customer experience of how your background jobs work. So you need to know this number to understand the total time uh, of how long it takes to run background jobs. So how should you manage queue time in Sidekick? Often queue times in Sidekick are self-inflicted. Uh, it's easy to create an inefficient queuing scheme and end up with this massive queue time problem that you just completely inflicted on yourself. So in Sidekick, we have queues, but we also have what I call process types, which is a configuration of a Sidekick process that will consume specific queues at a specific concurrency. For example, I've shown one process type here. So that's set up with concurrency 10. It consumes only from the critical queue and in production, it uses a concurrency of 25. You might uh, have a different process type, for example, that consumes the single thread queue and it has a concurrency of one. So uh, these process types are how we consume the jobs in our application. So a process type is pretty much similar to a, uh, a checkout register at the grocery store. Um, and then they have their own queue that they pull from. So the most frequent mistake I see with Sidekick queues is how each problem domain can get its own queue. We might call this domain-driven queues. So that is there's a, a mail queue, an invoices queue, a payments queue, and so on and so forth. Each queue only holds a few types of jobs. So usually there's just one Sidekick process deployed per queue. This style leads to a, a huge, huge, huge explosion of queues. Usually there's like 50 or more queues, all with different names uh, based on what kinds of jobs they run. And this explosion of queues is generally caused by a desire to avoid a pretty common problem, which I call crowding out. So what happens is that suddenly a large number of jobs get enqueued onto a queue, like call it the default queue or whatever, which means that any new jobs that get enqueued after that huge chunk of jobs are stuck behind that huge amount of job. So usually to fix the problem, an engineer will split this, this job that gets enqueued a bunch of into its own queue and its own process type. So in this example, we've enqueued a million of job B. And uh, if we want to put a new job A into this queue, it's going to have to wait until all of that job B uh, gets executed, and uh, that usually is not what you intended when you enqueued job A. The problem with this approach is that it ends up eventually causing huge amounts of wasted capacity. So with so many process types, most of them are just sitting idle most of the time waiting for work. This ends up costing just way, 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 way too much money. It's also difficult to manage and deploy, and there's just too many queues and process types that you have to keep track of. Instead, Let's try something different. Every job in your job folder has a service level agreement or SLA. So that is every job basically expects its total time to be a certain amount of time or less. So your password reset email, well, that SLA is probably really short, maybe like five seconds. It has a five second SLA. That's still 10 times longer than the SLA of your web request, 
by the way. Usually your web request you expect to be done in 500 milliseconds. So that, that SLA is actually really high, but it's short for a background job. And the SLA for a job that fills in old data on old tables, maybe that has a much higher SLA, maybe even up to like a week. So if you assign one of these SLAs to every job in your system, we can group these together to put jobs into queues. For example, we could come up with the following queue scheme. Within 30 seconds, within five minutes, within one hour, and within one week. We could also sort uh, all of our jobs SLAs and assign them into queues based on this queue scheme. So we might put uh, the password reset job into within 30 seconds. We'll put that data job into the within one week queue. So each queue now has its own SLA. It's a promise to the jobs that go in there and it says, we will start executing you within this amount of time. With this scheme, you only need four queues instead of 50 or more. So every uh, even more beneficial is that now every single queue and every single job now has a clear and obvious alert condition. When a job takes longer than its SLA to begin executing, you can sound the alert, page someone, and have them take a look at the issue. So how do you prevent crowding out in this scheme? And the answer to that is something that my colleague Kelly Sutton came up with at Gusto, and he calls it sharding. The idea of sharding a queue is to split one queue into n number of sharded queues. So for each job that you would assign to queue A, a client-side middleware instead, instead assigns it to one of n shards, which are named QA0, QA1, and so on. So these shards, in order to prevent blocking other job classes, are always assigned on a consistent hashing algorithm. So job A always gets sent to shard zero, job B always sent to shard one, shard C to shard two, uh, job C to shard zero, so on and so forth. So that means that a single job class will only crowd out one of these shards and not all of them at once. So like in my diagram here, job one always gets assigned to shard one, job three always gets assigned to shard two, job three always gets assigned to shard two, and so on and so forth. So finally, a simple tool that you can use to understand your queue times is what I call predicted latency. On a within 24 hour queue, for example, you're only gonna know that the SLA was violated after it's been violated. <laughs> so uh, it, that will have been 24 hours since the job has been queued. So a job has to be in queued, wait 24 hours, and then execute for this alarm to go off. And that is a very, very delayed wait time. Now you have no time to react. So instead, we build a new metric. Take the number of jobs in the queue multiply by the current rate that you are processing jobs and you'll get a time and that time is how long it should take to get through the queue if you continue processing jobs as quickly as you are now i call this predicted latency and it can be very useful to set up alerts based on this number uh, as well as alerts on your actual queue latency so give this a shot uh, kelly and i talked about sidekick at gusto which is a uh, Gusto's my client kelly's a, a employee there uh, and we talked about Gusto and Sidekick and how it works there on this podcast. Uh, check out this URL. We talk about these ideas and many more, so you can check it out there. So here are your to-do items. Rearrange your queues based on SLAs and then create alerts based on those SLAs. Even if you don't change your queue names, you should at least have a queue time alert on every single queue in your system. All right, let's talk about a different environment now, the web. So the fundamental difference between the web environment and the background job environment is the difference in expectations of total latency. So for background jobs, we expect those to be completed within five seconds at, at the fastest, really. Uh, but web requests, we expect to be done an order of magnitude faster, basically as fast as possible. Most web requests have a total latency of about 100 uh, milliseconds, 200 milliseconds even. But that is like 10 times faster than even the fastest background job expects to be executed. So the problem here is the same that it is in a background job. We usually have dashboards and instrumentation for service time. It's very obvious, okay, my whatever controller takes 200 milliseconds. 
What most of these services have instrumentation for web queue time, but they don't display it by default. They may not display it automatically. And that's because of a, a particular setting you need to go change or a particular thing you need to go add. We'll talk about that later. Um, but again, it's important to remember that the web browser experiences total time, does not experience just service time. So you need to have this instrumentation on your dashboard to understand what your customers are actually experiencing. And not having queue time instrumentation is uh, the exact problem that caused a, a major scandal in Heroku when it was first getting really popular about 10 years ago. A company called Rap Genius, which is now called just Genius, wrote a series of angry blog posts that accused Heroku of misleading customers about their queuing times. Heroku used to report something called queue time in their logs, but that was actually the queue time for Heroku's router itself, uh, not the queue time for the application servers. So Rap Genius had these extremely slow requests, but their instrumentation said everything was fine. We're gonna learn how to prevent this on our own applications. First though, I need to explain how request queuing works and where it happens. Most people have an incorrect mental model of how this works on the web. In almost all web application setups, requests are first accepted by a load balancer. That can be something like Heroku's router mesh, an Amazon ALB, something custom like an HA proxy setup. And the load balancer's job is to accept all the requests coming to the IP address pointed at by the DNS record. The load balancer then sends that request to a downstream listener server. Now, it's really important to understand that queuing does not occur at the load balancer. The load balancer accepts the request, then just sends that request on to a listener and usually uses a random or round robin algorithm to accomplish this. And there is no queuing at the load balancer. Instead, the listener, which is usually a physical server, a Heroku dyno, a Kubernetes pod, or something like that, uh, accepts that connection. And it's so important to understand that this happens at the operating system layer. The OS kernel accepts the connection, and that's where the queuing begins. The connection waits in the socket backlog until it is accepted by one of your running Puma or Unicorn or whatever processes. The socket backlog is where 99% of queuing occurs in your Rails application, because it's waiting for a Puma or Unicorn process to be ready and pick it up off the socket. So Unicorn and Puma are what's called a pre-forking web server. And all that means is that a master process boots, listens on the socket, and then calls fork to create n number of child processes. These processes now are also listening to that same socket. The master process then closes its own connection after the fork is completed. So we have n child processes all listening to the socket. And when a request comes in, that request is randomly assigned by the operating system to one of the child processes, which is free, ready, and blocking on the accept system call ready to pick up the request. When that process gets that request, it stops calling accept, processes the request, which means it's no longer listening on the socket and it won't get any more requests until it calls accept again. So, instrumenting this process is actually pretty simple. What we need to do is make the load balancer add a header to each request. That header, usually called X request start, is a timestamp with a number of milliseconds since the Unix epoch. So then, in a rack middleware, we check that timestamp against the current time and you've got the queue time for each request. When you report all these times to something like Datadog, you now have an excellent metric for determining auto scaling. It's important to realize that there is no reason to scale up the number of servers unless queue time is high. And if that queue time is low, you might even be able to reduce the number of servers that you have. So to understand why request queuing occurs on the web, let's just think about it. If we've got a server with three unicorn workers that gets four requests all at once, the first three workers are picked up by the child processes, and the fourth one waits in the queue because all the workers are busy. So queuing cannot occur if even one child process is available to accept the request. So think about that for a moment. 
If queuing only occurs when 100% of the workers are busy, which of these configurations is more likely to have a longer queue or to have longer average request queue times? Is it a setup with one child process, one worker, or is it a setup with four child processes, four workers? Yeah, of course. So the first one is going to have more request queuing. All it takes is one request to this server or pod, and now 100% of the workers are busy. The second one with the same load, uh, will, that first request will go to the first server, and then two, three, and four are all still free. Okay, so it will be will by definition almost have less queue time than that first server. I think we all kind of understand that one. That's a pretty simple example. But what about this setup? You've got four pods. Each pod has one worker. Or one pod, and each pod has four workers. Each pod, well, the one pod has four workers in it. So each of the numbers of total numbers of processes here is the same. We have four processes in the first configuration and four processes in the second. Which one of these will have more average request queue time? The second configuration will be, have much lower request queue times. Actually about one-fourth of the request queue time of the first configuration. It's a result in queuing theory that queue time is basically approximately proportional to 1 over s, where s is the number of servers that do work. So remember, in the one worker by four pods setup, there's actually four queues. No queuing occurs at the load balancer level. So request queue time there, we could say is equal to 1, because queue time in that system is 1 over 1. In the one pod with four workers set up though, request queue time should be one, close to one over four. So one over four workers per queue. This is a really useful piece of information to have. Um, I often hear that it's a best practice to run one process per container in containerized environments, but this actually works really, really poorly for pre-forking web servers like Unicorn or Puma for that reason I just gave you. Uh, it will add much, much more queue time to your uh, system, which means you'll have to run more servers than you would have to otherwise. So instead, I, I modify this advice for you. One master process per container. Uh, you want to have as many child processes as you can, as you want, really, but one master process uh, per container. Don't use two master processes. That doesn't make any sense. One master process per container. Uh, this is actually how Shopify deploys in production. Um, in fact, uh, Byroot confirmed for me on Twitter that Psych, uh, uh, Sop Shopify uh, uses 90 workers per, uh, per container. So they've got 90 uh, workers with 60 CPUs on Unicorn, um, on, and they'll deploy as many of those containers as they need. So... To minimize request queue times for the same amount of CPU and memory resources, run at least four worker child processes. So of course, if request queue times are proportional to one over S, there are gonna be decreasing returns as S increases. So uh, going from one worker to four workers cut our request queue time by 75%, but going from four workers to eight workers cuts it by 12 and a half percent. It's not not the same order of magnitude. So it's not as important after you've got four child processes. So that's why my rule is have at least four child processes or workers when you configure Puma and Unicorn. So here are my to-dos for you regarding web queuing. Instrument request queuing. If you don't specifically see a request queue metric anywhere in your dashboards, you are probably not tracking it. Most major services will measure it, but you have to have that X request start HTTP header. Uh, if that header is not present, then these services don't display a queue time. So usually you have to add that header somewhere if you don't see it. Set up auto scaling based on this metric. This usually requires some like metrics plumbing, especially if you're using Kubernetes or something more complicated, but it is worth it. 
Stop auto scaling based on CPU or other second order metrics. They don't work. Use request queue time for auto scaling. Same thing for Sidekick, by the way. Third, use at least four workers per pod, per dyno, whatever it is you have in your setup. Um, it's important in the web because each pod, each dyno has its own queue. It's not like Sidekick, where Sidekick queues are centralized. So uh, it doesn't matter how many processes we use per machine because they're all pulling from the same queue. On the web, each pod, each dyno, each server has its own queue. So we need to have at least four workers per each pod. Okay. Now, let's talk about the uh, last and probably the most confusing type of queuing in Rails, the global VM lock. So actually, the VM lock is no longer global. <laughs> it's funny because we used to call it the global interpreter lock, and then Sasada-san made the lock around the VM instead, so then it was called the global VM lock. Uh, but after Ruby 3.0, Raptors now run in parallel and use the VM at the same time. So the global VM lock is now more of a, a Raptor VM lock, Sasada-san suggested at Ruby Kaigi that we call it the Great Value Lock instead, which I think is really funny. Um, I'll keep calling it the GVL for this talk, but just know that Raptors no longer have to worry about this lock. So we're only talking about multi-threaded environments such as Sidekick or Puma. In Unicorn, you only use one thread, so you won't see any of this behavior. With the GVL, only one thread can run Ruby code at a time. So if two threads want to run Ruby code, one will have to block in a queue until the other thread gives up the lock. It will give up the lock in two conditions. Sorry, three conditions. One, the thread finishes whatever work it's doing and exits. Two, thread performs IO. Three, the thread is interrupted by the 100 millisecond VM interrupt timer. So even if you don't do IO or exit, the VM interrupts the thread every 100 milliseconds and forces it to give up the VM lock. So in Puma, when you add three app threads, effectively you now have four threads running. Uh, you've got the three app threads and you've got one reactor thread that Puma creates that we use to accept requests. So only one of these threads can only actually execute Ruby at a time and the rest of them can only wait or do nothing during that time. So imagine, uh, if you've got very I.O. heavy work, then this is totally fine. Let's say each request to your system spends uh, 75 milliseconds waiting on I.O., 25 milliseconds executing Ruby, and you've got two requests that come in. And this is my diagram here. Uh, the reactor thread gives that request to, to thread one. So that thread executes Ruby for 24 milliseconds and then waits. It makes the I.O. request and it waits. The reactor thread now has control and it can say, I can give that request to the second app pool thread and that thread then executes for 24 milliseconds and waits. So now thread one is gonna wait for another 50 milliseconds and during that time, the GL is going to be free, GVL is going to be free. It's not gonna be used by any threads for 50 milliseconds. Then when thread one's IO finishes, the request is finished and we'll, do, we'll run one millisecond of Ruby right at the end. And the same thing will happen in thread two. So now you've processed two requests in about 125 milliseconds. And if you had just one thread, one process with, with Unicorn, this would have taken you 200 milliseconds. So great, now you've, you've gotten rid of 75 milliseconds and 75 milliseconds faster. Um, the second thread though, experienced 25 milliseconds of time queuing for the GVL. But that's better than 100 milliseconds queuing for an open child process like this would have been with Unicorn. So you're probably thinking, great, let's just add threads everywhere. There's more threads all the time, 100 threads. But the answer is that's too simplistic. Uh, this example I gave is really, really too simple. It's not how applications really work. Um, imagine instead that we al alternate every millisecond between IO and Ruby. Let's also imagine that we uh, set our thread count in Puma really high. Let's set it to 100. And then we've got 100 requests in the queue. So what happens is that the reactor thread constantly will be grabbing the GVL, sending requests to threads in our application pool. But once we've got a lot of requests running in threads, each one of those threads wants to grab the GVL to run Ruby. And now there's going to be a huge line, a huge queue for the GVL. And 
this doesn't affect our throughput, the throughput of our application will still be very high. We'll still, we'll still process lots of requests per second, but the actual service time of every single job will get really, really high. Imagine a checkout counter at a grocery store where um, the register, the person at the register, like kept grabbing people from the line and checking out one item from their cart, checking one item from their basket. And then at some point they've got like 20 people that they're just, that have one item checked out. Um, that checkout counter could get through those 20 people in the same amount of time if they just did one at a time. Um, so the throughput hasn't changed, but each person's service time has now gotten really, really long. So if you reduce Puma's thread count to just five, request queue time gets really high, but the requests which are, uh, are serviced get serviced quickly. And if this happens for real in production, instead of adding more threads, what we should really do is just add more servers behind the load balancer. We should add more processes. So. High thread counts can actually lead to excessive service time in Puma and Sidekick. And in Sidekick, this is less important, but for web requests, we usually want them to be as fast as possible. Uh, Evo Anho has uh, actually created a new profiler for the GVL that you can use to observe this behavior and development on your own applications. Of course, you can also benchmark your own apps uh, to find the best thread count for you. Finally, um, I'm just gonna tease you about this. Uh, there's actually some really simple computer science theory you can use to figure out a table like this one, which kind of gives you the best thread count for the amount of IO wait time in your workload. Um, I've written more about this topic here at, uh, at this URL. So this is my, my rule of thumb table for what your concurrency or thread setting should be on Puma or Sidekick, given uh, a per percentage of time waiting on IO. There's actually another fix for this problem too, and it's been available in Puma since version five. We call it wait for less busy worker. And this was uh, submitted as a patch by GitLab. So thank you, GitLab. Here's how it works. When GitLab investigated switching from Unicorn to Puma, they encountered an issue with uh, how Puma queues. Under high load with moderate thread settings, so like a pool size of five, like I just said to use, they, had, they still had average, a uh, higher average request latency. Remember, I said that the operating system randomly assigns a request to a listening worker process. So it will never send a request to a worker process that's busy doing other things. But what about a process that's got four threads that are processing other requests, but all four of those threads are waiting on IO right now? Imagine the Puma cluster with three workers. Worker one has no busy threads. Worker two has one busy thread. Worker three has three busy or four busy threads. So if worker three's four active threads all happen to have released the GVL, that worker listens to the socket and a new request will come in, which one of these workers will we assign the request to? Which one of these workers will the operating system assign the request to? Well, ideally it'd be worker one because worker one is doing literally nothing, but it's random. So uh, if all these processes are listening on the socket, the worker three will get the, the, get, will get the request one third of the time. So what do we do? We want the operating system to prefer less loaded workers. It would be really cool if we could sort the list of workers listening on the socket uh, so that the operating system would give the request to the least loaded worker, but we can't really do that really easily, uh, but we can do something else. Wait for less busy worker causes a worker to listen, to wait to listen on the socket if its thread pool isn't completely empty. So worker two and worker three will sleep for a little bit before they call accept on the socket again. And that means that in high load scenarios, uh, the operating system will not see those, those workers listening to the request and listening to on the socket and instead will s assign requests in a queue to less loaded workers. So the net effect is that in high load scenarios, service time decreases. And that's because workers with more busy threads are gonna be slower than workers with no busy threads. Um, and we're gonna get those requests assigned to faster workers. So prior to this patch, GitLab had a bit of an increase in Puma latency, or in, increase in latency when they switched to Puma. Um, and after this patch, they, they saw latency was the same. So this option has been extremely successful and it's been so successful that we're gonna make it the default in Puma 6. So my to-do for you, for the GVL, 
set thread count to 5 for web or 10 for sidekick. Uh, monitor service time under load, and if you see service time increasing when machines are heavily loaded but CPU usage is below 80%, you probably are seeing GVL queuing. And upgrade to Puma 6 or turn on our wait for less busy worker setting. And that wraps it up. That wraps all the kind wraps up all the kinds of queuing I wanted to talk about. Queuing for jobs, queuing for the web, queuing for the GVL. And uh, let's quickly recap what I wanted you to take away from this talk. Arrange queues based on SLAs, create alerts based on queue SLAs, measure web request queuing, set up auto scaling based on those queue times, use at least four child processes, use uh, thread counts of five or ten, depending on web or sidekick and monitor service time under load to make sure you don't have that concurrency setting too high. And finally, upgrade to Puma 6 or use wait for less busy worker. That has been my talk. Uh, I hope to see you all in person at the next Kaigi on Rails. Thank you.